Okay. Welcome everyone uh, to the electric vehicles event. Um, I'm just in, in, my name's Terry Jackson. I'm just introducing our speakers tonight. Uh, can I ask that you mute during the talk so that we're not getting echoes, etc. So our first speaker is going to be Nikki Panakis. She describes her experiences researching purchasing an electric vehicle. And this is her bio. I can let you read that yourselves. Our second speaker tonight is Dave Parks um, from The Social in Watlington. Uh, they've now, if you didn't know, they're providing private parking at the uh, EV parking at the social club. In case you haven't worked it out, I don't like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> and Anthony Simpson is our star speaker. He's our local our expert on electric cars. Oops. Sorry. His talk aims to answer some of the key questions. Are, are electric vehicles greener? How close is the EV transition? Can our electricity system cope? Does it matter what time of day we charge the vehicle? Um, finally, what embrace, why embracing smart meters is vital as we head towards net zero emission. Again, I'll let you read his bio. I need to There's your page, Nikki. Let me know. Lovely. Thank you. Nikki. Thanks, Terry. So I'm Nikki uh, and uh, I stole this slide from my son's talk for an Earthshot competition. I just thought it was a really nice slide to just show what this is all about. It's all about trying to uh, move towards uh, a better environment for the future and for our children. So if we could just skip to the next slide. So um, I moved to Watlington 10 years ago and previously I worked in london um in london hospitals and so i was used to using public transport so i was often on the tube or on the trains toing and froing and i did have a car but i only used it at the weekends to visit family or friends outside of london so very infrequently and then i got a job in oxford and my husband was working in slough and we literally took a compass <laughs> and plotted out Oxford and Slough and found that Watlington was in the middle. Uh, I also knew people who worked at the hospital in Oxford um, who had worked here and they said, oh, wa oh, Watlington's lovely. And they took me to the Half Moon in Cuxham for lunch and I was sold. <laughs> I was just like, 
Uh, and so Watlington was perfect for us because it's equidistant between Slough and Watlington, but it does mean it's a good 20-mile uh, trip in and out. And I've since had children, and my son goes to school in Oxford, so I have to take him in, and he goes to school in central Oxford, and then I have to go from central Oxford up to the Churchill. So it's quite a commute every day. So that's the kind of background, my background. And then if we go to the next slide, I kind of had a, uh, a eureka moment with the first lockdown. So being a doctor, I was a key worker. So I was driving in and it was taking me 30 minutes quicker even to get to work. And um, previously I was allowing 45 minutes an hour to do the school run and work. And so I realized that all this time I'd been sitting mainly in the Oxford traffic, chucking out fumes. Uh, my fuel consumption went down hugely in that first lockdown because of not sitting in traffic. And my car, which I bought uh, when I first got my job, was getting old and so i thought hang on uh it needs i need a new car and why not go electric and everyone was a bit like oh god fully electric are you not going to go hybrid i thought nope i use my car to to and fro mainly for work um and so electric i just wanted to just go for electric i just wanted to go for it and apparently uh, it is cheaper in the long run. So it's cheaper in terms of cost per mile. And there's stuff out there that says it's 2p per mile versus 12p per mile if you've got a, an elect, a petrol or diesel car. And there are reduced maintenance costs because there are less moving parts in an electric vehicle. So all those things were kind of swaying me towards going fully electric as well as uh, my sort of eco uh, bend, bend that I have. So the next slide. The other thing uh, that does help are the government incentives. So right now, if you want to buy an electric car, you get £3,000 off the price of the car, which is um, put on at the showroom. There's also uh, money that's put towards the cost of installing a charger at home. Um, and then clearly there is a government proposal uh, to go uh, electric or new uh, electric all new cars by 2030, which I think has now been bumped to 2040, uh, should be electric. So I thought, well, if I'm getting a new car, um, I might as well go electric now. The other big driver, so on the next slide, was um, what Oxfordshire Counts County Council are doing. And this actually has a significant impact on my commute, particularly between the Churchill and school. So Oxford, Oxfordshire County Council are really green and they're really innovative uh, in terms of a local council nationally. And they've come up with this EV infrastructure strategy and they're piloting a zero emission. Uh... Sophia, sorry. Can you go and, sorry, it's my daughter. <laughs> Can you go and ask daddy, darling? Just go and ask daddy. Sorry, she's meant to be in bed. <laughs> so anyway, they um so so initially they were going to put um, gates in between um, my commute to the school for a pickup, and that got blocked. So um, but now they're doing ze a zero emission pilot. So you can only enter Central Oxford if you if you drive a zero emission car, and that is going to start in August. So that was another massive driver for me to go electric because I want my son is only ten, and I want to be able to um, pick him up from school and drop him off. So being able to quickly get from work to school and then out again was really important. So it's interesting, isn't it, that the council have have pushed me <laughs> to do this. I mean, it's fantastic what they're doing. They've got funding um, to become an ultra low city, and that's looking at putting uh, on street charging points in residential areas. And this is an issue we have clearly in Watlington. You've got these narrow streets. There's not much on street parking. Where are you going to charge your car? They've looked at pop up charging points uh, which go into the ground. And Oxford clearly, Oxfordshire County Council clearly have a low emission strategy, an air quality action plan, and low carbon Oxford target. So it all feeds into that. And I've really noticed 
hugely this year at the school gates. The number of EVs that are at the school gates um, has just gone up exponentially. So I'm sure it's partly because of this zero emission pilot uh, that is starting in August. So um, clearly going electric improves air quality, it reduces emissions, that's carbon, nitrogen, particulates, and it essentially decarbonizes transport. And I'm sure Anthony will talk about this, but we had ecotricity, which is again purely green electricity, but we've switched to octopus. And there's lots of reasons for that. They're, they're really good, they're completely green, they're cheap. But if you have an EV, they have preferential cheaper charging rates overnight. So I can plug my car in overnight to charge it and it's cheaper than charging it at any other time of the day. So it's sort of it's targeting the EV um, consumer um, and making it easier and cheaper for you to charge your car overnight. So that's what we've done. So we're getting a smart meter, you know, we're going to charge it overnight on this uh, tariff, the octopus, and, and that's something we've done in addition to getting the EV. So next slide. Uh, so for me, so this is very personal, but you've seen the background. So those are my thoughts behind why I wanted to go electric. And then it was just a case of which car. And that's a very personal thing. Um, I previously uh, drove a Toyota Yaris. So I wanted something similar in size, uh, nothing too big. I've got two children, so it needed to fit the kids in. Uh, range was clearly an issue, so the distance you can drive on a single charge, and then clearly cost is an issue. So I looked on um, Auto Car and Auto Trader and various YouTube websites and um, just did a bit of research on all the different cars and which were the best small cars out there. So if we just go to the next slide. So like I said, I wanted something comparable to my Yaris, which is the, the car at the top there. And I kind of narrowed it down to uh, things like the BMW i3, which has been around a long time and is a nice, small, nippy car. Peugeot have um, turned their 208 into an E208, and that was a nice car with really good write-ups. Um, Volkswagen have the ID3, which is their... Um, They've, they've built it up from the, from the ground. So they have got the e-Golf, but that's essentially a Golf that they've turned into an electric car. But what's really nice about the ID3 is this new concept car that Volkswagen have produced, and it's built up specifically as an electric car. So there are things about that that make it more attractive, like where they put the battery and therefore how the car feels when you drive it and all the wonderful technology that goes with it. Um, so the ID3, I actually held out for that one so I could test drive it and see what it was like. Um, Nissan Leaf has been out for some time and there's a couple of those at the school gates. And then I wanted to look at the slightly larger SUVs, um, particularly the Kia e Nero, which has had excellent write-ups. So there were, there were loads of smaller cars that were just three-door, so like the Renault Zoe, which I thought would be a brilliant car if I didn't have children. So that's probably what I would have gone for if it wasn't, if space wasn't an issue. So the four that I've circled there were the ones that I did a test drive on. Um, again, very personal. I don't like massive cars. I'm not a fan of SUVs. So the Kia e Niro was just too big for me. So that excluded that. Um, I did test drive the Peugeot and really wanted to like that because that was by far the cheaper one. Um, but it felt very small and claustrophobic after driving a Yaris, which has that lovely kind of goldfish bowl feel to it. And you're really high up. And before that, I had a Micra. So again, always been in cars with really good all round visibility. And the Peugeot to me just felt really, really cramped. So it then came down to the i3 and the id3 so if we go to the next slide so then when you look at cost oh yeah sorry yeah so you can see the bmw i3 on the left and the id3 on the right so that's what i narrowed it down to so if we then look at the next slide you've got some kind of idea of cost so the bmw i3 has been around a long time and and that was really um a positive for me and I have a friend who has one 
um, and she absolutely loves it. It is a bit funny the way the doors open, as you can see in the picture, and that is an issue if you're parked um, in a car park where you're next to each other. And she said sometimes in like a supermarket car park, you might struggle to get the doors open. I didn't like the sound of that. And she has much older the children than me. And I didn't really like the sound of trying to put a four-year-old in a car seat with um, doors that open awkwardly. It's also more expensive. You know, it's, you're looking at £39,000 on the road. So that is an expensive car. Um, and the range, it's about 160 miles to about 200 on a charge. And, and so the ID3, I held out for that. And when I, when I did the test drive, I just completely fell in love with it. I think it's kind of a visceral thing. It's like buying a house. Um, it's really roomy. Um, it feels good. It's kind of sexy. You know, it's got all the wonderful, it's like you're driving a computer. Um, much like the BMW i3, um, but it's got an amazing range. Um, so I went for the kind of middle range. So they have different, there are seven different types of ID3. And I went for the cheaper one, <laughs> the cheapest one, um, because that's what I could afford. But even with that, you know, my range is 200 miles and it came in at under 30,000 pounds. So when you add in the government grant, the dealership uh, gave me some extra money as well. I then put down a £6,000 deposit, and now I'm paying something like 290 a month on a four-year contract with them. So for me, that was affordable, and that, that, was, that was a much, much um, better price than I was getting from BMW. So I got a kind of sexy car that I really like driving <laughs> at a price that was comfortable for me. So I think the last slide is a picture of my car and there's my son charging it for me. So it's certainly aligned with my eco values. It's incredibly fun to drive. I haven't said this, but going from a, a car with gears to an EV, as soon as you put your foot on the accelerator, you just shoot off. It's really responsive and really fast. And that makes it really fun <laughs> to drive. Um, and it's got excellent connectivity. So what they call the infotainment. So uh, it, it, my phone can talk to the car. If it's frosty in the morning, I can get my phone to defrost the car before I get in. These are simple things, but they're great because they just make life really easy when you're in a rush to get to work in the morning. I'm now an addict to podcasts. You know, I listen to podcasts on the way to work and it's, it's just great fun. And it is better for the environment and hopefully it's going to be cheaper in the long run, even though the outlay initially is quite big. So that's it. Hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Hello, monthly payment again, Nikki? Sorry? What was the monthly payment? So it comes in under 300 a month. So that varies depending on the deposit you put down. So my deposit was 6,000 and it's on a higher purchase agreement. So I've got the car for four years and then I will return it and see, see what, you know, it's like having a phone. They're like, oh, in four years, they'll be even better and you can upgrade to a better ID3. <laughs> So that's how they sell it to you. What about tax and insurance? So the insur So that's a really good question because people kept saying to me, oh, the insurance is huge on an electric vehicle. And it really wasn't. So moving from insuring my um, Toyota Yaris, which was a... Uh, uh, a five-door car, uh, it's really not that different. I would say it's probably £10 a month difference in terms of the insurance. You don't pay tax on it because it's electric mm -hmm. and like the MOT is all covered because it's a new car. Thank you. And Nicola, that was, that, thank you very much. It's very informative. Um, just 
just by the by, because I was looking at the weekend, I think we'll find the maximum amount of money now from the government is two and a half thousand pounds. Yes, they've dropped it, haven't they? Uh, yeah, just to incentivize it even more. Yes. Um, and also, I think the amount of money you can get from the government for helping with the electric point. My research says 350, but I thought I'd read it had gone down to 300 pounds. Yeah, I think they've just recently dropped all those incentives, which is really disappointing. Um, yeah, unfortunately. But the dealers, the dealership gave me a discount, which I wasn't expecting, and they gave it to me within 48 hours of picking up the car. <laughs> so, you know, I think they want to sell these cars. They want these cars on the road. I, think the other I ordered it before brexit um so i ordered it in october of last year it got delivered in january and i was a little bit twitchy about getting the tax put on it post brexit but that fortunately that didn't happen just one other thing the um obviously bw has come in for a lot of criticism over the last three years with the eagle gate fiasco uh how do the stack up that you are offered in terms of range um, how do they compare to reality? So again, another really good question. So um, it so they quote in in terms of the range for the ID three that I have two hundred and twenty miles on a full charge. When I fully charge the car, and you're not meant to fully charge the car, so I charge it to eighty percent, and then I let it go down to twenty, and that's where I keep it. Um, on a full charge, I, so when I'm up at 80%, I get 180 miles on the dial, not that it's a dial, on the computer screen. But in reality, I think I probably could get 150 because obviously I've been driving it in the winter. So there's the heating. I've got the radio on or my podcasts on. I I've got a heated steering wheel, I've got heated seats, something which is a complete luxury to me. And so all of that uses charge. And also it has different driving modes. So you have to be careful because when I picked it up, I think I had it in a sort of luxury driving mode. And then I watched a few. You don't get much instruction about how to use your EV from the dealership. So I then watched YouTube videos um, on the ID to learn about it because it is a bit like driving a computer and i was able to then change the settings so i now put it in eco mode and if you drive it in eco mode it pretty much reflects um what you've got uh, displayed on your screen but yeah i would say on a full on a full charge you're probably looking or not a full charge because i've never taken it out to a full charge but on 80 to 90 percent charge i reckon you've got 150 miles real world mileage on it so it's quite, in, the winter, uh, in the winter less than the uh publicized uh, mileage there. yes so they so when you read the reviews they do say this is what's publicized and this is the real world but the real world varies according to how you drive what other things you have on in your car like the heating the radio all of that and also what driving mode you're in thank you very much very informative yeah thanks so uh I think we'll move on to our next speaker now and we'll, we'll take up questions at the end of all three speakers. That was the original plan anyway. Uh, so Dave Parks, are you there? I am, yes. <clears throat> you want to take over? Okay, you'll sing that okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so what I want to talk about is at the Watlington Club, what our plans are for the charge points, kind of in the short to medium term. So I think most of you know about the club already, so you'll have seen we've refurbished the overflow car park over the last six months, which used to be kind of a waste ground and full of weeds. So we've refurbished that, put electric gates, lighting, CCTV coming in. Uh, we're now leasing out spaces to local residents. Uh, so as Nikki said, if you've got your own garage driveway, you're likely to have your own charge point. If you're in High Street, Couching Street, Sherborne Street, Brook Street, and others, 
you probably don't have that facility and that's particularly what we're looking at uh, in the car park here. Uh, so it's about half full at the moment, the half full of petrol and diesel cars. Um, what we really want over time is to transition to EV charge points and reduce the petrol and diesel cars in the car park. You know, we can do that through events such as this, but also through kind of discounting of parking spaces, etc., to look and make electric charge points commercially more attractive. And I was just looking at the news this morning, actually, and they're talking about charge points. And there's only about 25,000 in the UK, is what they said on the news, and there's about 400,000 needed. So we're really short. I've got a public EV charge points. So we've already made a start on this. We have the electrics in place. They were put in place when we refurbished the car park. Uh, so there's new single phase supply in there. We've got a new board and uh, cabinet in there. Uh, we've chosen the type of charge point we're going to use, which is 7.2 kilowatts charger. And this is more suitable for overnight parking. So you can see there from the next bullet point, you get about 20 to 30 miles per hour of charge, depending on battery size. So with the 200 miles or so talked about, that's going to be eight hours or so overnight. So this will be packaged as a parking space plus charger in conjunction with just the parking space for the petrol and diesel cars. So we're at the point now where we've kind of been putting this around for three months or so and are really waiting for firm commitments and interest before we invest in putting the charge points into the car park. And the lead time is pretty short on those, so we could actually do it within weeks in terms of getting the charge points. And we have the electrician lined up who's done all the electrics anyway. Future possibilities. So this is, I think, where we go from overnight parking to fast charging. Uh, so we've actually just got three phase further into the club site. Uh, so you probably all know about the Orange Bakery coming to the Scout Hut. So that has three phase now. And we also have three phase to the, the electric uh, circuits at the tennis club, which is only five to ten meters away from the car park. So the three-phase setup is already in the board for the car park. So again, that would really be down to the, the electric companies to lay the three-phase from tennis to the car park. That would be the lead time to get three-phase charges in. And there's three times as fast as single-phase. So instead of getting an eight-hour time, you get kind of two-and-a-half-hour time, which would be more booking a slot within the business day rather than having an overnight charger with parking space. And this is where you all come in really. So we're ready to go. We want to install the charge points. Uh, we are continuing to take leases, leases for diesel and petrol, but would really like to start to move that to include electric vehicles in the car park. So we are reserving spaces in the car park for EV charge points at the moment, and we'll do that for a few months, but I think we really need to see higher levels of interest if we're going to continue to do that after, after kind of three to six months. So that's, that's kind of one question for everybody on here and in Watlington. The, the other is, what is the demand for the three-phase fast charges for the daytime? So thinking in terms of local residents, particularly probably local businesses or business people that come into Watlington perhaps who are parking during the day. And that's it from me. So I think we're going to take questions at the end, were we, Terry, rather than now? Yeah, that's right. So thank you very much. Okay. That's great. So Anthony, are you ready?
hi yes i think i'm i'm all ready great the screen okay yeah okay uh that was really interesting to hear actually because um I, I was having a little look earlier there's a if for anyone who's interested to see the distribution of uh public charge points around the uk um there's a brilliant app called sap map or a website which you can look at and i had a look at watlington and i did spot when i last looked that there wasn't any so absolutely brilliant to hear um, that dave's been working on this and um that's that's looks like that's all set to change so that's really really great and um and also it's it's brilliant that watching nikki's presentation made me realize all the things i'd forgotten in my presentation there's not a huge amount of overlap surprisingly and so that's great and uh it's really interesting to see how thorough nikki was and all the thought processes she went through um trying to s s s select the right car for her and um yeah I, i've noted down two or three things that, that i need to change in my own presentation as a result of, of watching those so thank you um okay sorry i probably can show my face not that you particularly need to see it but anyway um right so um so just very very briefly um as i say my background um i, I used to work in the it industry but i decided i wanted to, to 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 change my day job to get more involved in in hopefully helping to contribute to 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 changing the situation with regards to climate change um, and that led to doing a, a, a master's course uh, and then I spent about in renewable energy and sustainability and then a few years in solar uh, project development and uh, and then I got a, a call I wasn't expecting someone from uh, University of Reading called me and, and asked me if I was interested in a car project and I, I said to them I hadn't actually owned a car for several years at that point um and and i explained it was about electric cars which 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 was intriguing to me at that time and, and i had a look i looked into some of the research because i'd heard some perhaps mixed information at that point about electric vehicles um but after sort of reading as much as i could at the time i decided it was something i wanted to get involved with so i i spent i worked in a two-year project at the university of reading with um a company called drive electric who are electric vehicle leasing company in marlow and um, as a result of that, after the two year project, uh, Drive Electric um, separated out a smart charging company called CrowdCharge, which I, I've worked for since. Um, so, yeah, this is just to share a little bit of information, perhaps a bit more at the I guess about the industry and and just how the automotive and energy industries are now getting very, very close together. So. And very briefly, this, and this is what motivates me, this is why I do the public talks. At the moment, we're losing about a million tonnes of land ice to the sea every minute. So um, there's lots for us to do. There's still time for us to, to halt climate change. Um, but but we, we have to, we have, certainly in this country but, and, and, and other countries as well, we've got to take a much deeper approach. We've got to, to make much bigger steps this decade and um and and hopefully stabilize uh the temperature uh, increase at well below two degrees centigrade um so the kind of things i'm going to talk about a bit about the environmental impacts and um looking at it in several different ways um also some of the barriers that that, that have um i guess um slowed down the growth of electric vehicles historically and, and Nikki has also touched on one or two of these and then a bit about the range and charging and then I want to briefly talk about the energy system and how it's going to cope with us uh, and again Dave pointed out um, you know the need for much um, more comprehensive charging infrastructure across the country um, to ensure that we can all get a charge when we need to charge and and, and get on our way um, so yeah that's sort of brief overview so just very very quickly the the the, the first thing to, to to just quickly mention is if we look at greenhouse gas emissions for the uk as a whole um then if we go if we'd gone back a few years ago the energy that we use 
um, would have been the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. But because of big changes to that, with a big reduction in coal and a big increase in wind and solar, um, that, that's now changed. And the, the energy supply, um, see, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have dropped by two thirds. Now, the, what, the, the one sector that's, that's had the least amount of change over the last nearly 30 years is the transport sector. Um, it's only dropped 5% in nearly 30 years. And, and when you think about all of the developments in engineering and science over that period, that's, it, it's really not that great. So there, there's a lot to do in the transport sector to change that. And about 70% of emissions in the transport come from cars and light duty vehicles. Um, so one of the thoughts is, well, what, why have greenhouse gas emissions barely changed since 1990? And again, something that Nikki pointed out was this thought about what type of car should we buy? Now, over the last 10 years, or this is actually eight years, 2010 to 2018, this lists the biggest reasons why global greenhouse gas emissions have actually increased. And unsurprisingly, the power sector is top. And that's because there are obviously many people in the world who still don't have basic electricity and services, in, in some, particularly in some developing countries. So um, that, that they've been installing power stations to, to, to help provide those basic services that we have taken for granted. Um, so that's not surprising. Um, but the, perhaps the huge surprise is the second most popular or second most popular, second biggest reason for increased greenhouse gas emissions is because our vehicles are simply getting bigger. And it's something that the, 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 and the trends rising on the right hand side shows you how we've seen a shift towards much bigger SUV type vehicles. And I know they vary. Some of them are, are smaller. And so, and, you know, there's a great there's a, uh, a grading of SUVs, if you like. But we certainly are seeing a big shift from sort of 20, 10, 20 percent um, up to maybe 30, 30 plus percent now. Uh, and, and that's a trend that's happening in most set, uh, um, you know, um, areas across the world. So, I mean, I, I, I would I, I like like Nikki, I would always advise to people just to think and about what size vehicle do we really need? And, you know, think about the car sizes that perhaps we were brought up with, which were probably smaller than the vehicles we're driving today. And just really test that because there are implications irrespective of, of whether it's petrol or, or electric. Um, so yeah, that's just an interesting thought on the size of vehicles has been growing. I also uh, remember being in a meeting recently where one council was contemplating changing their car parking spaces because cars were getting so much bigger. Um, and, and this is just a quick reminder that, again, as, as cars get bigger, you, they will become less efficient. And again, that will happen both for electric vehicles as well as petrol and diesel. Again, there is some variability across different vehicles, but very, very broadly, um, the, 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 the bigger the vehicle, the heavier the vehicle, the more energy it's likely to require. And obviously that energy has to come from, from somewhere. So I'm going to start by just showing you some of the, uh, I guess, a couple of research comparisons for greenhouse gas emissions. And um, the, this is a fantastic uh, recent or, um, or up to date, as, as, as I've seen, um, comprehensive life, lifetime report. So it doesn't just look at the emissions of, say, the petrol and diesel versus the electricity you put in an electric car it also looks at the manufacturing footprint of the vehicle and, and the manufacturing of the battery um, so again all of the slides are sourced by the way um, but you're welcome to email me afterwards if you want a copy of the slides um, but it's it, it's very interesting and, and they explain some of the reasons why often we, we, we see quite negative comparisons with evs um, and uh, um, versus petrol diesel and it's often because a lot of the research is out of date um, so if I just show you a couple of examples on the left hand side here we um, there is a comparison between a Toyota Prius which is probably one of the most efficient uh, combustion engine vehicles that there is on the road at the moment compared to a Volkswagen e-Golf um, and 
what 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 the bars show are the CO2 emissions um, per mile for over the lifetime of about 150,000 miles. So the blue bit at the bottom is for the manufacturing of the vehicle, and then the grey bit above is for the fuel to power the vehicle. Um, in the case of the e-golf there's an additional orange bar and that is the footprint of the battery so what that shows you is that the manufacturing footprint of the e-golf is a bit higher than the prius however once it's actually driving it's then several times uh lower emission and and the reason there obviously are i i, I know we, we hear the term zero emissions which isn't a term i particularly like because i think it's a little bit misleading because um whilst there isn't an exhaust pipe you obviously do have to put electricity into the vehicle and then it depends on on where that comes from and we've got quite a decent amount of renewable energy in the uk uh, electricity system but we do also have other things like gas and coal and and Oh, well, sorry, very little cold, but we do have a significant amount of gas. So anyway, to, so, so their assessment was that it was around about a 54% reduction. And as I say, if that was a less efficient uh, car than a Prius, then it would be an, a much bigger drop than that. Um, and then on the right hand side, I've got a couple of slightly bigger cars. We've got a Mercedes C-Class uh, diesel compared to a Tesla Model 3. And this shows about a two thirds reduction in greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle. Um, so yeah, but so it gives you a sense of scale. So we're, we're in that region of around sort of 60, 65% um, is the kind of improvement you're likely to see. So the, the, the second reason um, in terms of emissions is air pollution. And uh, there's been quite a lot of focus on this and that that led to um, again. Uh, uh, I know one of the previous talkers uh, speakers mentioned about the uh, diesel emissions um, uh, scandal, if you like, where some of the uh, vehicles were being um, manipulated during the testing procedures um, to to make them appear less uh, polluting than they actually were. And obviously there were some very big fines paid by these companies. But I mean, air pollution is a very, very um, serious problem. Um, it, 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 you know, not, for, from all forms of pollution, it's, it's responsible for eight or nine million deaths a year and, 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 and a few tens of thousands uh, of premature deaths in the UK. And, and that's also had a big um, or been a big reason why we've seen a focus on how we can reduce these particulates in, in our cities. Um, as, as, re, as a result of some of the issues with the way in which the tests were being manipulated, the test process has been improved and it's um, and, and much more um, comprehensive. It's still not perfect. And, and um, as I say, you will never see for a petrol, diesel or an electric car, you'll, you're never likely to get the um, test procedure um, range or efficiency compared to real world, because obviously um, in a test situation, it's likely to be um, you know, uh, slightly more preferable and, and, and optimized. So what it's going to lead to, by the way, is a change in air pollution and how we um, how we approach it in the past. Now, what all this shows is to, this is a timeline from the year 2000 to 2030. And it's it's the this shows the source of um, uh, small particulates that are that the, these are the particulates that are most damaging to human health the 2.5 and um, the the big yellow chunk are the um, the type of particulates that were coming out of our older diesel vehicles and has been the real focus of trying to 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 minimize these. And so what we've seen is that as the uh, standards have changed and improved for diesel, they have been gradually reducing um, over time and should continue to do so. Um, but so what but what we will now see is there are there are there is still particulate pollution coming from other things like the, the exhaust um, that sorry the, the road from the brakes and from the tires. Now the brakes um, and 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 as I say, that there is 
it's fair to say that there's the research is still ongoing to actually compare some of those other forms of particulates for you know uh, traditional diesel petrol versus an electric car there are some swings and roundabouts in there um, but certainly what we are doing in as part of this transition is looking to eliminate the huge yellow chunk and then as i say looking at different methods to try to reduce these other aspects um, and things like modern regenerative braking that you tend to see in electric car um, that for example will reduce the the particulate dust that, that, that from the wear on the brakes. Um, for anyone who knows uh, a chap called um, Mike Berners-Lee, uh, uh, who's an academic at, at uh, Lancaster University, he's written some great books, including How Bad Are Bananas, uh, which he's just updated, 2020 version, and another book called There Is No Planet B. And what what he he did some fag packet calculations, but but what this was again to try to bring home the that the human cost if you like of of driving um diesels in uh urban congested areas and he estimated that uh, a typical vehicle could could release or, or sorry could take away 12 minutes of human life uh per mile driven um in an urban congested area if it's diesel and that would compare to uh, half a um half a minute for electric so a ratio of about 25 and petrol is significantly better than diesel but but not as good as the electric uh, so again it's just a different way of looking at it but um it it, it, it does it air quality has been quite a significant driver to um focus on uh, some of the zero carbon policies that are starting to emerge in places like oxford as, as nikki said um to try to to really reduce this type of pollution and it's not just oxford who, who were one of, uh, i think the first to announce such a comprehensive ban but we're also seeing um cities and uh, across the the world of paris athens and mexico madrid um and, and and that's just increased and um hugely over the last few months and now and and what we've also seen over the last couple of years is country bans being announced for petrol and diesel vehicles now both because of the pollution and also because of the greenhouse gas emissions um, so the earliest in Norway and about 75 percent of new vehicles registered in Norway are plug-in um, it's partly because they've got a lot of money, ironically, from fossil fuels, but uh, that's enabled them to, 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 to put that money into this transition. Um, and then uh, many countries have gone for 2030. The UK started at 2040, but um, it, it, it's now looking like it's going to be 2030 in the UK as well. So, um, so yeah, it's going to be very, very different in, in a few years' time. Obviously, by... by by banning the new sad from 2030 there are obviously going to be a number that are still in service for a number of years after that but but certainly um we're going to start to see the num numbers reduce and we're going to see more and more electric vehicles on our roads um and um, again one of the reasons um why the automotive companies have now really started to respond and we're seeing a lot more choice and again nikki illustrated this really well with with some of her research in terms of that that there was there's much more choice today than there would have been five years ago when you would have been looking at you know a leaf an i3 and a renault zoe and that would you know there wouldn't have been much else to choose from whereas now there are loads and loads of, of, of different choices now one of the reasons for that is the uh, European Union has put in a very aggressive target so in 2018 the average emissions of, of uh, or list emissions of new vehicles registered was 120 grams of CO2 per kilometer um, they've said that, that that's got to get down to 95 this year the, the the penalties for them not achieving this average of 95 are extortionate so it, it, it's they will charge the automotive companies 95 euros per gram um that that, that their average is over 
per, um, per car. So if they sold a million cars and they were one gram over the average, they'd have to pay 95 million euro fine. So this is, this is partly why we've seen quite a surge in registrations recently. And there's probably that's, that's also helped with some of the good deals, perhaps at the forecourt and dealers that, 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 that are now really keen to increase their mix and to re help re achieve these very difficult targets for, for them anyway. And, and what we've also seen is that the rules for the EU does allow the automotive companies to work together in pools or in groups. And now Tesla, who is uh, an American electric vehicle company, but they're 100% electric um, because they are effectively, um, they're, they're well below the 95 grams, then um, other companies are actually paying to become part of a group of Tesla and they're paying huge amounts of money. Um, so Honda and Fiat, for example, are paying Tesla money to be, to pull their, their their cars and to avoid having to pay at even higher penalties through the EU. And, and it's it, what that will do is that'll be very painful for them to have to pay so much money to effectively a competitor in Tesla. And so there's now a massive incentive for those automotive companies to change their vehicle mix as soon as possible to get well below that target. Um, and we've seen all sorts of announcements recently. So General Motors promised it would only make zero emission cars after 2030. That's a huge announcement. Ford to go all electric in Europe by 2030. Uh, Jaguar will be an all electric brand by 2025. And Volkswagen uh, 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 have committed an uh, absolutely huge sums of money to electrification so uh what's that uh, 73 billion euros um over the next few years so finally that there is now the, the the traction the policies um also the competition from people like tesla means that that uh, and 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 the city policies on pollution have all come together and and we're now really seeing this take off um so one quick question is, what about the batteries? How long will the batteries last? And um, it, this, this, is, this is an interesting question. And what I can say is that I, I've been to quite a number of industry meetings and uh, with the automotive manufacturers, and, and they are more and more confident. They've been learning a lot over the last few years about how to optimize the management of, of the batteries and the, um, the, 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 they use very sophisticated systems now to, 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 to manage them and to, to maintain their condition. Um, and I think it, it's highly likely that, 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 that the vast majority of electric vehicles uh, will be absolutely fine with their battery for their life. And this is a quick example on the screen. Uh, this particular uh, Tesla driver is, has done 1.2 million kilometers on the original battery, not recommending anyone does quite that many miles. Um, but there are also examples of, of Nissan Leafs that have been going 10 years that have done two or 300,000 miles on the original battery. You do see a slight degradation over time. And there's a very, very good report on this by a company called Geotab, who fit analytical um, data um, capture devices in, in all sorts of different vehicles. Um, but, um, but as I say, you will see a slight degradation, but it's also worth mentioning that as, as cars generally get older, the mileage is 10 to 4 because they tend to get used as a second car or as a local car as they get 5, 10, 15 years old. And, and so, you know, if Nicky's car starts off and it does 180 miles, you know, and it does 150 miles in 10 years time, that will still probably be absolutely fine for, 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 for the person that, that's, that's taking it on at that point in time. Um, so, yeah, so, so as I say, whereas there was this sort of wariness about it that, um, you know, would I have to change the battery after five years? That, that, that I think has disappeared. And it will also, as I say, it's helped by the fact the ranges are slightly longer as well in the first place, whereas the first EVs may have only been doing 65, 75 miles. And then it was a much bigger issue if you saw any degradation on that. Um, and very briefly, in, in terms of the environmental impacts, um, there are, you know, there is obviously there is mining involved with 
the battery materials. I mean, we obviously we shouldn't forget that there are huge um, environmental implications for the alternatives, such as oil, um, which is obviously um, brought out the land in, in huge quantities. Um, so, um, but but in terms of electric vehicles, um, there's a report by an organisation called Ele Element Energy called Battery on Wheels, and it talks about ha um, the EV. Um, how much uh, of, of the battery can actually be recycled in Europe and what their estimate is that that um, at the end of life uh, at the car at the end of the li life of the electric vehicle 80% of the batteries will still be fine to have a second life probably helping to support the electricity system in a static battery system um, and then about 20% of them would need to be recycled. And then once, the, uh, because they're, they're, they're perhaps too degraded at that stage. And then um, of those, once they, they would then go into a recycling process and about 75% of the content can be recycled. And again, I think we're going to see a big shift and in, increase in, in trying to, to get industry working much more closely to work towards a circular economy and, and to ensure that, that uh, and, and the good thing is, it's in their economic interest as, as well as environmental to reuse a lot of these um, um, materials, because it's, it's often much, much cheaper uh, to, to, to recycle than to um, mine it in the first place. Um, and the, the other thing is that, that, again, some people worry about human rights as well. And, and uh, cobalt, for example, it, it, it is used. There's a few um, um, that th th there's sort of several kilograms of, of cobalt in an electric vehicle battery quite often. Um, and that one of the biggest markets historically has been the, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And there has been, you know, some issues with the, perhaps the mining security and that's enabled some illegal uh, labor and, and also illegal mining, which has obviously been unsafe. And, and um, Tesla is actually working to eliminate cobalt altogether from its batteries. And they've already reduced the amount of, from 11 to four kilograms on, on all of their vehicles. And in fact, some of them they've gone further um on um all this i'm, I'm not going to go into any more detail on this if you're interested in the mining there's a, there is a great uh youtube channel called plug life television there's an expert a battery expert and he's got a couple of great episodes on there about batteries and resources and where it all comes from and the recycling and things but what this shows is that over a period of time the dark blue column is the cobalt content of electric vehicles and as we've seen the chemistries and compositions of the batteries change we're seeing the per percentage of cobalt falling all the way and in fact now electric buses in china have zero cobalt in and now the new standard range teslas that are made in china they don't have cobalt at all so um that's going to help in terms of phasing it out um the, we're also seeing an increase in cobalt production in other markets such as australia and i think uh, canada and and so i um, at the moment the demand for for the DRC cobalt is actually falling. Um, and then I just very, very briefly wanted to show you, I know this looks slightly complicated, but the key message to take away here is just to explain, some people say, well, what about hydrogen? Should we be thinking more about hydrogen vehicles? And I, I think that we, 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 that there are some hydrogen vehicles and, and um, at the moment, the difficulty is, the efficiency of producing and, and hydrogen and converting it into energy, at the, which basically means that you'd need more than twice as much electricity to go into per mile to, feed, to, to, to supply a hydrogen uh, car compared to uh, a, a regular electric vehicle. Um, but, but that's not to say that there will be many applications for hydrogen. It's likely over the coming years, um, potentially for much bigger scale transport and also for other energy storage applications, and it will inevitably get more efficient. So I, would, I, would, I wouldn't rule it out, but I think that we're not going to see many hydrogen cars on the roads over the next few years. I think that, that, that 
uh, the lithium ion batteries have, have, have progressed much more rapidly than perhaps we expected. And it's made hydrogen less attractive for, for cars at the moment. And very briefly, in terms of biofuels, um, I'm very, very wary about that um, from simply a point of uh, if you look at the land use required for biofuels, it's absolutely enormous. Again, it's covered in uh, Mike Berners-Lee's book, the There is No Planet B, where he has some really interesting data on that, which just shows you we've got to be really, really careful about how much land we're prepared to commit to um, biofuels in, 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 a, in a situation at the moment where we've got quite an extensive deforestation happening. We've, we, we, need to, we need to change that and, um, uh, and, and use it for very you know, careful um, and, and specific reasons and, and road transport is unlikely to be one of those. So just looking at some of the, the other barriers that people have talked about and um, about uh, the cost of cars and access to charging and the amount of choice. So first of all, the cost of the batteries, which has been the, the biggest issue in terms of cost of electric vehicles, has come down by about 90 percent since the year 2000. And um, we're, at, we're now some electric vehicle companies companies are probably around $100 per kilowatt hour of battery. So that, that has been one of the huge reasons why that we're now getting to, to this point where it, it's becoming um, feasible. And when you've not just taken to a cost, they are still a bit more expensive, but when you then factor in, as Nikki mentioned, the actual running cost with, with the maintenance typically being about half and the fuel costs being about a third to even five times less then um you know for many people it already stacks up um, and one of the or i guess to, or a couple of the big drivers for the um electric vehicle batteries has just simply been scale that building them in huge quantities in highly efficient factories um tesla has built uh, the biggest factory in the world and um in the in the nevada desert it looks like a giant iphone and um and 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 again so, so they they've got latest you know robotics and 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 highly efficient production processes and what we're now seeing is 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 you know rather than niche production of a few units in a perhaps a non-specialized factory we're now seeing all the automotive companies looking at, at, at changing their production lines and producing them using their fantastic engineering skills to drive down the cost um, and also down here a company you may not have heard of byd who i think are the, the largest electric vehicle uh, uh, manufacturer in the world they're a chinese company and i think there's that the, 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 there are many um uh, asian manufacturers that see an opportunity to um leapfrog that some of the european and, and american automotive companies because in 2019 only one percent of the cars manufactured in europe were plug-in uh, sorry were fully electric in china it was seven percent in 2019 so many of them see a really good opportunity to get ahead and again because they got into this space and invested in this space that's and uh, it's also helped contribute to this big reduction in in cost of batteries um the other thing that's been quite important is, is, is the improved energy density. And all that means is you can fit more battery in the car. Um, so where, you know, what may have taken, um, you know, the, the battery sizes are two, two and a half times bigger than they were just a few years ago. And that's been through systematic reductions and or improvements in energy density, as well as the, the, the prices making it possible to do that. Um, and Deloitte recently estimated that they think there'll, there'll be a real tipping point in about 2022 when, when they see the cost of ownership being on a, on a par. And uh, again, it's been already mentioned, there's, there's still one or two incentives in place to try to help to nudge people towards electric vehicles, certainly the early adopters, to help to, to stimulate this and get, get the... Um, Get, get get them the momentum and then obviously over time those incentives will be gradually reduced and phased out as the volumes go up and as the cars get cheaper um and yeah and this is just a quick comparison from drive electric but it just it's it, it's just a very simple example but it just compared a, a hyundai electric uh, uh ionic 
um, which was about £270 to lease compared to a Ford Focus or a Mondeo, which was 235 or 300 pounds to lease. But then if you can charge the car at home or at work, then the, the fuel cost is dramatically lower. And so then the monthly cost can actually be lower. And it, again, everyone's circumstances are slightly different, um, but it, it certainly reached a point for many companies as well as individuals now where it's it's starting to financially make sense as well once all, all of those numbers are, are, are taken into account uh, what we've also seen is the government has made major changes to the company car tax incentives for electric cars and so for anyone who's entitled to a company car um, you pay what's called benefit in kind tax so because you've been given a company car and it's a a perk for you then you, you have to pay tax and, and many people pay three or four hundred pounds a month in in uh, that that tax and for electric vehicles which is the blue buy for the next couple of years it's going to be dramatically lower so i met somebody recently at a petrol pump and it, it was somebody who who you know usually when you chat to people they're often talk to you and they, they talk about the fact that they it was a for environmental reasons but this particular person said oh i didn't really know much about electric vehicles but when i realized i could he said the vehicle i was driving um which was a bmw diesel he said i, I would have been paying it over 400 pounds a month and now i'm paying 25 30 pounds a month in in tax so it's made a huge difference and and he was very happy uh, uh, with, with the car he chosen so i think what it, it changes then the nature and 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 and, and the breadth of people that are, are, will take note that, that that perhaps the early adopters you know it had slightly different reasons and and now people are just seeing economically it makes sense for them um and in terms of the choice of electric cars it's interesting to mention that henry ford's wife drove an electric car uh, back in 1912 um and she had a range of 80 miles which is pretty decent i don't think it went more than about 20 miles an hour um but when her husband um uh, henry set up the, the production line with the i think it was the ford t um she declined she stuck with her electric car so be like clara um so and and this is just a very quick illustration of the choice change that we've seen this this is the kind of options you may have been faced with five or six years ago which which you know for many people it just didn't offer um to, to suit their circumstances and for their family and other things that they they needed to accommodate in the vehicle and the range wasn't good enough and now what we're seeing is vehicles across the board of, of all different shapes and sizes um, and the top left, for example, is the ID, which uh, Nikki chose, uh, which obviously is a, um, a very, very good. And, and obviously it's going to be produced in, in, in very big quantities. So, again, that, that, that's, that will have helped them to get that price right down. And the one on the top right is a, a, a Kona, which, it, um, which is, again, it's a fantastic car. It's got a really, really good range. It's a very efficient vehicle. And then you've even got Jaguar now bringing out a fully electric vehicle to compete with um, the Tesla. Um, so, yeah, we're seeing a real change now in the options that people have. People often ask, say, how long does it take to, to, to charge the car? And and it's 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 a slightly tricky question to answer because it depends how fast you charge it um so most people um at the moment have, have been charging the car at home and that depends obviously i think it's just over half of people have access to off street parking at home and therefore can do that they can put a charger as 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 um um as has been described earlier uh, and and you know plug it in and then the, you can often get about seven kilowatts power at home and um and, and um however if you use um the uh public network you're likely to charge at a much faster speed so each car has two connectors one for a slower charger which is as i say designed for home but also for some there are some seven kilowatt um public chargers as well and then as i say in motorway service stations or other uh, perhaps uh, and, and then they're popping up in all sorts of locations now you may get access to 50 um plus 
kilowatts, which allows you to, to, to charge up in a much faster time. So it's a slightly tricky question to answer. And it also depends on how much energy you need, because if someone stops on a motorway services, you don't tend to go from empty to full. You tend to charge however much you need to get to, to you know, comfortably to where you're heading to. Um, so, you know, for me, a typical um, motorway stopped probably 20 to 25 minutes, which is about as much time as it might take just to stretch my legs and grab a cup of coffee. Um, and you can comfortably charge a vehicle overnight at home. And um, I think, yeah, so this just shows you the, a, an example of the two types of, of connectors. As I say, there are slightly different model uh, versions, but, but you've got a really fast charging um, connector, which tends to be bigger, and then one for home. The one at home tends to charge at about 25 miles per hour, um, which is about the average number of miles people drive in the UK. Uh, um, so about an hour's charge a night, uh, if you did 8,000 miles a year, would, would, would be enough. Um, or you might only charge twice a week, and, you, and then you're charging for three or four hours each time. And then a, a, a rapid charging network, then it can charge at around about 175 miles per hour at, at, at the basic level. And then there are some vehicles now that, that will charge much more quickly. So Tesla has its own charging network and you can charge well over 100 kil kilowatts. So that's, you know, 350 miles per hour speed. So it, 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 they're certainly getting faster all the time. And as I briefly mentioned, if you if you're interested to see whether what the coverage is like, if you use ZapMap, look at their website or their app, you can you can filter. Now there are um, I think uh, uh, was it Dave mentioned there's 25,000 charges at the moment across the country. This is just the very very fast chargers because there are ones that are as I say sort of like like domestic charger speed, and then you can get access ones that are much much faster. And so if you filter on those, you can now see that there's pretty good coverage across the UK, um, but it's still not perfect. And and the the ZapMap website keeps you updated. So. Um, they've installed 140 rapid charges in the last month. Um, and um, as I say, that, that it's growing all the time and it needs to. Um, and as I say, what I would say is the one thing I would I would urge caution is if you're not able to charge at home because you don't have off street parking, then you do need to think very carefully about where you are going to charge reliably. Um, before you go to a pure electric vehicle, because obviously you, you need that security if you rely on the vehicle for, um, you know, let's say a daily commute, you don't want, you, you know, you need to be certain that, that you're going to be able to charge it. So do that, then you need to look carefully at what your public charging options are, or perhaps, um, again, increasing numbers of workplaces are now putting them in, in their own car parks, which might help many people. And then we've, we've got our first, um, uh, the, well, the world's first uh, forecourt that is uh, brand new in uh, Brentwood, and it's just electric ve um, vehicle chargers, so, which is quite interesting. So 36 electric vehicle chargers, and you can see the speeds vary as well. And, and for, for the cars that will take it, some of them will go as high as 350 kilowatts. Um, so that 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 would probably be more like a five minute stop at a charger. Um, but as I say, at the moment, many cars will charge between sort of 70, uh, 50 and 100 kilowatts is, is more standard at this stage, but it will get faster and faster. And, and that's likely to be the solution for people who can't charge at home in a few years is that they'll simply go to a, a somewhere like this and just charge up in, you know, 10 minutes or so and, and be on their way as, as the charging times get faster and the volume of charges improves. And this just shows you how we, we the, the number of um, fully electric vehicles in the UK has changed. So it's been pretty static at about one in 200 for quite a few years. And then suddenly uh, 2019, we started to see a pickup. And then last year, we're up to nearly 7% of uh, new vehicles registered are fully registered and that's I think we're about eight percent so far in 2021 so it's now steadily climbing so it won't be long before we're consistently over 10 percent and, and and higher um, 
the, the other thing I was just going to quickly mention is that um, we also need to think about how many vehicles we want on our roads. And um, at the moment, there are 1.4 billion cars in the world. But if everyone was like us in the UK, where we've got about one car for every two people, then that would nearly triple to sort of closer to 4 billion vehicles in the world. So hopefully we'll also see improvements in um, uh, car sharing services and um, you know access to alternatives hopefully um, our towns and cities will become much more inviting for cyclists and 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 walking and also many people are now looking at things like e-bikes e which often um, where cycling perhaps wasn't quite within range the security of having a battery and the e-bikes are extremely low emission and a really really great option and for some people now they will prevent them having to have say a second car at least and so yeah hopefully we won't see everyone be like us we'll see the globe and and, and um in improving things like car sharing and i saw a, a recent article saying that i think is it um the number of people uh, or, or between 18 and 24 is down substantially a few hundred thousand in terms of the number of actually passed their driving test so it, it looks like the younger generation are very open to trying to utilize things like car sharing and other things where it's feasible. And of course, in many areas, it's not so easy. And so someone like trying to get from Watlington to Oxford, I can imagine the journey you're doing now, that's much more difficult to navigate via public transport. Um, okay, I'll keep going. And, uh, and sorry, very briefly, just because I thought this was interesting, in 2019, a third of the electric vehicles in the world were buses in China. They have, uh, I think it's nearly 400 or 500,000 uh, uh, electric buses now. Um, and if you compare it to the rest of the world, so this is the scale in China, 150,000 of the bars. This is the rest of the world. And the bar only goes up to 2.5 thousand. So it's tiny in comparison. So the China's really led the way to try to drive down emissions in their centers through public transport. And uh, I'm sure we're going to see more and more of that um, in, in Europe, too. Um, also, incidentally, there are 300 million two to three wheelers that are fully electric in China as well. So, again, it's going to be interesting to see if we see more um, a, 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 the two, three wheeler options as well, which, again, have got a much lower manufacturing footprint. Um, not perhaps ideal for the uh, school run, but for, for some people, for some some situations, um, maybe we'll see more of those as well. And then, sorry, I hope, I know, uh, sorry, I hope we're doing all right for time. I just want to very briefly talk about the energy system. And just to let you know that, that whilst we almost take electricity for granted and we plug things in and we use our energy as and when we need it, and the same will be the case for electric vehicles, um, it's worth noting that there is a very complicated balancing act going on in the background. The amount of energy being generated by our power stations and including wind farms and, and solar as well as nuclear gas must exactly match the amount that we are demanding. So it, if it's too high or it's too low, then the electricity system can, can fail. So there are constantly people working around the clock uh, at the things like the National Grid Control Centre to, to, to adjust power stations and ask people to turn things up and turn things down and respond to, to, to what we're doing. Um, and there is a cost to that as well. So uh, obviously, um, the, the, the mix of energy and the demand for energy is constantly changing. But, but what tends to happen is a very, very rough idea. It, it, and it, hopefully it makes sense. The higher the electricity demand is, the higher the cost is and the higher the emissions are. And that's because it's very cheap. That once you've built nuclear and solar and wind to, to actually generate that unit of energy, next unit of energy is very very cheap so they tend to come onto the system first and then you add on to that things like gas um, to to get to, to meet demand so what 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 happens early evening is if everyone came home from work and plugged in their car and 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 drew a lot of electricity then chances are you, you're going to be driving the system to to turn on more gas to supply that 
Whereas if you were to wait and charge the car during the night, then there's far more chance that there's going to be a significant amount of wind power that needs to be used um, that, that can be, be taken up. So it's really important that we get our, I mean, Nikki again mentioned it's like driving a computer, um, but, but it does mean that there is the smart technology can be brought forward to to help to balance the energy system by charging it uh, uh, intelligently in the background on our behalf um, and and not only would that be more environmentally friendly it will also drive down the cost of electricity for everybody so it is something that we need to take seriously and um, as I say uh, I'm gonna so I'll skip one or two of these slides just to, for speed um, so uh, again the cost of um, driving electric car is about two to four pence if you've got a one of these cheap overnight rates like nikki has then it could it can you can get to around two pence per mile and as i say i think it's about 10 to 15 p people typically pay for diesel petrol so it's a big reduction if you can do that at home um and it it the, the, uh, it you know so you will see an increase in your electricity bill but it's going to be a dramatic saving on what you would have otherwise paid for for fuel and uh diesel um and very briefly we we're involved in a project with 700 people and um if you allow people just to decide when they're going to charge their car and they're just on a regular flat tariff this is exactly what the pattern we saw so from midnight to midnight the blue bar was the end is the average consumption of houses where you see it's low in the night it increases during the day and then it goes up early evening when we come home from work and school and then falls as we go back to sleep that was the same pattern that we saw for people electric vehicle charging and that and that actually makes sense that people the most convenient time to plug in was when they got home from the school run or from work and and then the car started charging but that's the worst situation for the energy system and what we're looking to do is you we, we, we've got a smart platform and one of the things that we're looking to do is you plug in but then if you're not going to use the car till eight o'clock the next morning then rather than um charge straight away it waits and then it fills in and, and matches the energy during the night at, at the best time and that usually means it's the cheapest and lowest carbon time um and and ultimately what we would want is not just like an economy seven we don't want everyone to charge at midnight either because things like uh, things um again will just create a new peak we want we want it to be quite fluid and to move around and tonight the wind wind output in the uk might be higher at 4 a.m but tomorrow it might be 2 a.m and you want systems to be analyzing this regularly on your behalf and all you have to do is plug your car in and that it figures out right this is the best time and that makes it better for everyone and for environmentally and, and also in terms of cost um and so um i would encourage people uh to to be open to smart meters i know not it, it, it's taken a long time and some people have not been too happy with it but at the moment if you don't have a smart meter the energy industry doesn't actually know when you're using your electricity and it's becoming increasingly important for them to have sight of that in order to manage the system as cost effectively as, as possible and as securely as um, for everybody and also by having smart meters you then enable yourself to be to access some of the time of use tariffs available because if you if you if you do have electric car your energy bill will go up and so so moving into one of these new electric vehicle tariffs and, and accessing cheap energy off off peak is really really sensible decision and you'll find if you join any forums that that, that many if not most electric vehicle drivers definitely do that and that's that that's really uh, good and hopefully in the future um that we'll start to see all of those car batteries uh, where people opt in getting involved in aggregated um, patterns to help balance the whole system um, and, and if we do that it reduces the number of new batteries we need to build to balance wind and solar and things if we can use the existing batteries in cars um, to help do that 
So very interesting. I think I'm going to stop there. So yeah, in conclusion, if you don't need a car, don't get one because even uh, all, all cars do have a, a, um, a carbon footprint. And um, so, it, um, but if you do need a car, obviously try to minimize the trips and particularly at, at congested times or in urban areas, try to choose a highly efficient model and smaller cars tend to be more efficient and have a lower resource footprint and try to avoid diesel. Um, and, and even with electric, if you don't need a huge, you know, the one thing I, I perhaps I'd be a bit worried about is, is if we start to see huge vehicles on the road that are electric with massive batteries. And again, they do have bigger footprints and, and ultimately, you know, we've got quite a steep, uh, descent to make in terms of our CO2 emissions as, a, as a, 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 a globally and, and a, as a country. So, you know, I'd encourage people to, to think about what, what, what's a sensible vehicle for them rather than perhaps the, the biggest thing that, that they might be able to go for. Um, and explore these new time of use tariffs if you are thinking about going electric and to see how you can reduce your electricity bill as well. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, um, and as I say, if anyone's interested in the slides, you're very welcome uh, to contact me. My email address is is on the on the slide here. And there's also one or two recordings of my talks at everybighelps.org forward slash talks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anthony. So I'm sure we've got some questions now. I've got a question, if I may, Terry. Uh, Anthony Leonard has his hand up. All right. Okay. So I didn't see that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've put my camera on. Um, I've, I've got to go because my son is desperate for me to go downstairs. But I just wanted to share a slightly different um, e experience from Nikki. Um, I bought a secondhand leaf as a Christmas present to myself. Um, and it cost me ten thousand um, pounds i did have it was a big wrench i had a, a 15 year old two hundred thousand pound a uh, two hundred thousand mile uh santa fe um that really did guzzle gas um and cost me a fortune parking in in london um i was putting it off because i was i was having all of these worries about well i've got embedded carbon in that car shouldn't get rid of it, um, bloody, bloody, but, and it just didn't want to die. But I decided to, to go for it. Um, the other thing is I live on Sherburne Street, so I don't have off street parking. Um, all of my charging is either probably illegally running a cable across the, um, across the pavement, having put it through my letterbox because I rent, um, or public charging. Uh, work number one is 17 miles away. Work number two is 40 miles away. Uh, I travel every fortnight down to London, which again is a 40 mile trip. Um, and I have a boat in Portsmouth, which I've done two trips to, and I'm going down to again this weekend. All of that has been done with public char charging. Um, it could be better, but actually it's doable. Um, uh, and I'm coping. And the message that I would give is, you know, it, it's not, it's not a step too far for anybody, really. Um, for us oldies, it's just like planning a journey in the 70s um, when there weren't very many petrol stations around. You had to think about where you were going and where you were going to stop to, to fuel up. It's, it's the same now. Um, and it's a slower pace of life. I've got a 10-year-old. Um, we went to get our hair cut the other day, plugged in in Tesco, because it's free in Tesco, um, to, in Prince's Risborough, um, I went to get out of the car and he said, where are we going? And I said, well, we're off, we've plugged in, we're off to get our hair cut. He said, oh, no, I thought we were going to chill in the car whilst we charged for a bit, because um, that's what we do now. Um, so I've still got a lot longer, uh, 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 you know, there's still more in my eco journey to go. Um, but I just wanted to share that because, you know, you don't have to buy a brand new car. It doesn't have to have super range. It is possible. Life life can um, exist at the, the sort of the poor end of the. Well, no, that's a that's a that's a very judgmental way of saying it. At, at, at the at, at, at the sort of cheaper end of the second hand market, 
and that is getting a lot lot better so yeah that's what i wanted to to share with everybody that's really interesting thank you and, and it's all over your charging cable on Sherborne Road. <laughs> yeah, you probably have. Most people, yeah. I'm sure, have. It's um, worth checking it's what Reading you Borough. That you got it that price second hand because I did look at second hand, but I'm, I was looking at so things like the BMW i3 second hand. It's still thirty thousand pounds in in the retailers. So you were good to get one that cheap. But yeah, that's great. Le leaves yeah, leaves are very common. Yeah, leaves are very common. I mean, I, yeah. I, I did a I did a test drive of a brand new leaf, you know, the first generation leaf 100 years ago or whatever it was. Um, uh, so that's how long they've been. I think they've been around as long as Priuses have. Um, so that's why you can get leaves cheap. There are lots of them out there. You can now filter on auto trader for, for electric cars, which is a bit easier on fuel type, which which, which helps. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really good point because we should add that don't forget that most people don't and have never bought a new car and, um, you know, and that, and most people buy secondhand cars. Um, and obviously, and, 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 you know, for, and, and for some people, because it is a, more, a higher capital cost up front, then um, what will help is that there will be more higher range secondhand cars coming coming on stream but as you say anthony even some of the secondhand cars available today for many people will be absolutely fine do i have a point terry i'll, I'll go for it I, I'm... Sorry. I had to mute because of my clock chiming <laughs> carry on very interesting anthony pretty good stuff um I guess one of my issues is that we tend to beat ourselves up in the UK about our sort of greenhouse emissions, and you know, kind of quite rightly, broadly. Um, but I was I was just looking, sorry about the stats here, but if you look at the top 20 countries, uh, the UK is the um, it's the 17th out of 20 as the polluter, and you look at if you look at uh, China and the United States, they come up at nearly 60 gigatons of emissions and the UK comes up at 0.37 sorry 0.37 gigatons as against as against as against the total of, of America and China of 16 gigatons so we're point so we're like if you like something like a 40th of their combined output so finally and I guess I, I had to declare my interest as a petrol head uh, although I'm here because I'm interested and I just kind of wonder how, you know, what are the other, what are the other 17 countries doing? You know, we've got India, 2.65 gigatons, and so it goes on. And, you know, are we, uh, is it really quite so vital that we focus on this, or should we be working yes. perfect into getting other countries to lead first? I mean, it, it, okay, it's a really interesting point, Chris. And I mean, it, f firstly, um, you know, it's worth mentioning that nearly half the electric vehicles and nearly half the renewable energy that, 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 that's, that's being installed is coming from China. So whilst they, they clearly do have, or, you know, they have a lot to do to decarbonize and they've had quite a high dependence on coal, that they, they are, they are also, um, very much at the forefront of the transition and of, uh, helping to enable us to get access to a lot of this lower lower carbon technology. Um, the, the, what I would say, by the way, is that the, the one of, there's a big issue with with, with 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 some of the data. So the, you mentioned 0.37 gigatons, which basically is about five tons per person in the UK. That that's the global average. Now. Uh, it, it's misleading because it's our territorial emissions. Um, it doesn't include our international aviation, which is five times the global average. It doesn't include the stuff that we import, and we import far more stuff than we export, and our emissions are nearly twice that. So our emissions are twice the global average. And with something that I, I, I push is, is it's, it's so important. The stuff we're buying, the stuff we're, we're consuming and the food that we're eating is, it, is, has a huge impact in other parts of the world. And, and for us as the one of the wealthiest, um, may not feel like it at times, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, 
for, for us to be twice the global average, I think it, we, we, we have a responsibility and we have a, and the, the other thing with comparing with different countries is, of, you know, often the, the per capita, I mean, the per capita emissions in China are much lower than, well, that's, it, it depends if you look at that territorial one, they look similar, but they are actually lower. India is much lower than our emissions. And obviously there are many people who still don't have access to basic services as well but i think we have a leadership role and and we we are seeing this change we're even seeing it in the us which has a pretty appalling carbon footprint we're definitely seeing it in china and in india they've seen the cheapest solar prices in the world at down at about one cent per um uh, kilowatt hour for their solar contracts so they're in that they they they've cancelled a lot of their uh, fossil fuel projects and they're building huge amounts of solar um so you know it's one of those situations where you know there are also a lot of tiny countries who who who, who have tiny tiny footprints that are being very hard hit already by climate impacts and and i feel you know that, that and, and 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 that is partly what motivates me those people matter and, and have a voice or should have um and, and we need to set a lead and, and we need to, you know, not, and, 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 it, and it has to be all encompassing now because when you look at our real emissions, because of our imports increasing and our, um, our aviation emissions increasing, we're only very slightly down on where we were nearly 30 years ago. And we need to get down to not, not too much more than one tonne um, over the next 20, 25 years um from 10 tons so you know let's not all wait for everyone because the outcome for everyone would be disastrous i think we just got to we just got to go for it because there are many people in all of those countries that are trying to go for it as well okay. that's my opinion i think the per capita uh, aspect is, is is very relevant and i'll give some consideration to that so thank you uh, there's a few questions here that people have put in chat so i'll bring bring these up now um what is the lifespan of the battery and how much does a new battery cost um, um so you you can actually um there's a there's a com company uh, well there's a youtube channel called fully charged and they are dedicated to electric vehicle videos and uh, for anyone who watched red dwarf in the old days a chap called robert llewellyn is behind it and he, he does lots of presentations on the fully charged channel all about evs and in fact they just showed the other day a, um, a, a garage that now does battery swaps um, and in fact what they're doing is they take batteries from old nissan leafs that have been in car accidents but where the battery is perfectly all right and then they're swapping those in um, and I'm trying to remember, I think they charge something like £8,000 to do a swap at the moment. Um, but as I say, the actual cost of the battery for manufacturing, if they're down at um, $100 uh, a kilowatt hour, and um, I'd, I've got a Nissan Leaf with a 40 kilowatt hour battery, the manufacturing cost of that battery now is about $4,000 um so you know and, and like lots of things it, it, it you know i'm not saying that I, I can go and get a new one for that price you pay more than that but the prices are going to keep coming down but i i i just i cannot see that, that the vast majority of people will be changing their batteries because the the, the cars that are having their batteries changed had started off with much much smaller batteries with a much smaller range and as i say things like the um, battery management systems and things have now improved to, to such a degree that I just think people will will buy a car that suits their needs. You know, if you if you do, I do a regular commute that's, uh, you know, 20, 20, 25 miles round trip. And that's most of my driving. And so I actually, if I as long as I got an electric car that could do 75 miles, that would be absolutely fine. Um, but for some people who are doing long distance driving and doing long regularly and going around the country, then they, you know, they may need a bit more. But I, I don't think we're going to see very many people changing their battery or needing to. I mean, if I was to get a second hand car with, you know, um, older technology on a battery, then I'm likely to have a battery that's not going to last as long as the, this brand new technology that's coming out now where they're unlikely to need 
replacing any time soon. Is that likely to be the case? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, yes, yeah, so you, you'd need to think about what is the realistic range of the vehicle that you're looking at and is that comfortable for you for your life and for the journeys that that, that you do and um you know and i know some people for instance who choose to hire a vehicle periodically for their long distance drive if they've got um, a smaller range second hand and but that does most of their driving and they're quite happy with it but it yeah it's just figuring out what sort of range is going to be comfortable for you and um I wouldn't and need actually, a huge range. It's just I'm just realizing that I'm not in the market, going to be in the market for a brand spanking new vehicle. And yeah. so I don't want to fork out for something secondhand and then find I've got to find a few grand for a battery in a, a few years' time. And that's that would be my only concern. But um yeah. yeah, and one of the things that you can do is 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 when you go and view it, you can ask that it's fully charged up and you can have a look, you get an indication by looking at the you know the number of bars that show on the screen and the range that's presented on the screen um i mean uh, you, you know you have to remember as as has been mentioned you don't often get quite that range because um of the um you know that that's in op that might be in optimal conditions um but it just gives you a, a an idea that hang on is that in the ballpark that i was expected and then think you know if i took 20 miles off that would i be comfortable with that or no hang on that's way too close to core it's not going to be suitable okay thank you so we have a question from jenny that was i think directed at nikki so we can give anthony a rest uh why did you reject the nissan leaf It's all very, it's very personal, isn't it? What car you choose. The Nissan had, Leaf had a good track record. Um, it was mainly size. It was just that bit bigger than a, than an ID3. Uh, a couple of people I know have a Leaf. I know it's got some really good positives to it. Um, particularly the regen mode. I think that's really good on the Leaf. Is that right, Anthony? You've got one, haven't you? <laughs> I understand that's better than the regen mode on the ID3. I just didn't test drive it. I used to have a Nissan and I think it, I just wanted a car that felt um, a bit more aspirational for me. And, and, and going back to a Nissan was just not what, what I fancied at the time. I mean, I'll, I'll quickly mention um, partly the reason that I have a Nissan Leaf is because I'm involved in some trials of two way charging or called vehicle to grid. And that's where the energy can actually, um, it, uh, with a particular charger, can be taken back out of the battery and put back into the energy grid. And this is, um, we're involved in three trials for these types of this type of technology to see how well it works. So it's 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 all very new. Um, but and but that's that that's one particular reason why I have a Leaf um, because it's one of the few vehicles that will will do that. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 like Nikki says, that there, there's all sorts of different personal reasons, to, and and but also, you know, compare them, compare the range. A very very good website is called EV Database. Very easy to find, and they have every EV in the market available and loads of information about each of them, including realistically how lot, how far they'll drive, you know, roughly how much they cost what's you know huge amounts of information so ev database is is well worth a look thank you so another one for I've known that <laughs> sorry <laughs> damn but i am happy with what i bought <laughs> yeah it's, oh, it, it looks like a great car <laughs> so nikki um phil and phil crockett asks did, did you consider leasing rather than purchasing i did i did um I did look into that and, and as an NHS worker, there's a, a very favourable NHS uh, leasing company for, for NHS staff and I did look at that. Um, why didn't I do it? Um, I stumbled at the first hurdle, I think, when it was all about um, registering my salary and getting logged in and all of that. 
it, it probably and uh, and actually a friend of mine a colleague of mine has leased a tesla through that scheme and she thinks financially it's actually a lot cheaper overall and other colleague the, the friend who's got the bmw i3 is now thinking of switching to leasing so i probably should have done better research on that <laughs> um yeah i mean it's definitely an option you can lease the id3 through volkswagen as well they do give you that option um rather than the higher purchase scheme but there was just something about it that put me off thank you Nikki. don't mind if i jump in briefly um my name's elaine regardless of the tom robinson that it says here on the screen i have a, a zoe a renault zoe and i chose to lease mine uh and some of my reasons where I, I i got the car back in october and we were still sort of mid logs down i wasn't entirely sure what my usage would be i didn't have a car prior to that i mostly well i was at the time living at london and now i'm living with my boyfriend tom here in watlington uh so i thought i'd be driving back and forth a lot but i wasn't really sure what my usage would be so i, I went the leasing route they have been very happy with it How, how does the lease, how does the lease and higher purchase differ? Because the higher purchase mentioned four years. You mentioned four years, Nikki. So how how do they how do they differ? I'm not an expert in the financial side of things. You so with the higher purchase, you have to put a deposit down, and then there's a monthly fee that you pay, and that monthly fee is influenced by the deposit you put down, the length that you agree to have the car for and then you can either return the car and um or you can buy the car at the end of that period and they give you a sort of guaranteed price for the car at the end of that period so you may actually have some positive equity but then i've heard from other people that that isn't very much um and and then you can but then you have to start back you have to start back at the beginning again. So if you then want to upgrade to another car, you still have to find money for a deposit. Whereas I think with leasing, you don't have a deposit at all, is it, do you? It's just your monthly fee. No, you, you do have a deposit. You, but do. you can pick your range. And I forget what the full range is, but it's either sort of six months, I think is maybe the minimum. But they mostly will look at maybe nine or 12 months of what your monthly rate is going to be as a deposit. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think because I did look into the, the purchase to hire, hire to purchase uh, option, and it is an equity situation. But if you are not going to buy the car at the end of it, it's more expensive. So if you if you think you are going to want to upgrade to a different car or you're not sure you're going to want a car at the end of your lease, doing it purchased a hire and then saying, actually, you know what, I don't want to buy it will be more expensive for you in the long run. So if you're not committed to it, you might want to consider, therefore, just doing a straight lease. But you do have a deposit up front and then your monthly payments as well. And then with the lease, does that affect your insurance? Because that was the other thing, because you don't own the car. Not that I'm aware of, but when I spoke to a lot of the insurance companies, it, it actually almost wasn't a question. I My lease contract said I had to make them aware of it, so I called them back to say, oh, I, I didn't tell you this, and, and they actually didn't care. Um, okay. So that I don't, from my experience, that didn't change anything from insurance. I think the, can I just say, whether it's relevant or not to the discussion, like the, the difference between, uh, I think, a lease and an HP is that on an HP deal, at the end of the HP deal, you own the car. And under a lease, the, the ownership title never reverts to the lessor. It only stays with the, with the, um, uh, the garage, basically. I think that's the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I just, I just wanted to respond actually to to Dave's question from his presentation. For starters, thank you all of you. It's been really in, informative and interesting. And uh, Dave, from my standpoint, I would very much be interested if that three phase charges came in to do a sort of to do that type of things. I we have off street parking, but I don't have the access kind of like Anthony to, to run a cable out my window and charge the car. So I'm, I'm fully reliant on the public network. And as, as Anthony Simpson uh, told us, you know, I, I use Zap Map 
religiously and Watlington's actually in a bit of a dead zone. The closest charger to us is at least about 10 kilometers away at Lucna. But during lockdown, that has been shut off a lot of the time because it's at a hotel. So that's been very unreliable. And then you're looking at Henley and Wallingford. And, you know, Nikki, I didn't actually know that you're not really supposed to charge it to 100 percent. But as someone without a charger, I feel obliged to, because if my round trip is going to take 15 percent of the charge and I only charge it to 80 and then I come home and I only have 65, I, I have... I have a lot. I have quite a lot of sort of charge anxiety sometimes of where I'm going to get my next one, and I've gotten a lot used to it, and I feel much more comfortable now knowing where the charges are and what I'll be able to do. But Dave, if if that three phase sort of not not the rental of the spot, but the sort of rental of a time period or, or to kind of come in and use it, that would definitely okay. be really interesting to us. So that's very good to hear. I think you're the first person who's actually been interested in the fast charges. So <laughs> that's a question for everybody else on the call. Is is anybody else interested in the fast charging during the day, potentially? I'll take that as a no. I do wonder if it's a little bit of a chicken or an egg situation, yeah. that if, if it was available so. in Watlington, people would be more encouraged to, to have the car, but yeah. not knowing if it's there can make right. people unsure right. or uncertain. Yeah, so I, I think the other option too. I, I think what's going to happen though, Dave, is you're going to, you're going to be inundated with people wanting to uh, join you as soon as the uh, the lawsuits start coming in for people <laughs> tripping over cables because that is sure <laughs> going to happen yeah. definitely going to happen um, i think yeah. uh, my recommendation is you know so i have three phase on my house luckily which is which is awesome but i don't have an electric car yet but people will travel if they hear there's three phase in watlington for a fast charge yeah so there are the there's benefits and it may well be that long term you know, but, but especially from Anthony described in terms of where charging technology is going, the off-grid options and all that kind of thing, it it may well be that becomes a de facto standard. So investing in that early may well be the way to go. Yeah, I've ended up in all sorts of strange towns just because I, I was looking for a charger. So we, we, we in Watlington could become that town. <laughs> yes. So Terry, could we put that yeah. question out there following the meeting then? Because obviously with three phase, there's quite a lead time on getting the, you know, Southern Electric to put the three phase in, although yeah. it's very close. You know, what we did for the Orange Baker is about a two to three months lead time. Yeah, I think it would be a good idea. So if for we you can know as soon as possible if they are needed, <laughs> then we can kind of get the wheels in yeah. motion. Yep. By the way, in, in the Reading Borough Council are considering a, 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 a pilot to an, to, to to enable people to 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 run a cable to their car but that you have to request permission and pay for a small permit to do it and then i think obviously the cable has got to be then um laid in in, in a particular way to ensure it's not a trip hazard but if anyone wanted to just check what that was about i think it's reading borough council you just might want to google it and just double check if that kind of thing perhaps could be I think that could be useful in other areas as well to make sure, obviously, that there isn't any um, trip hazards. Yeah. So I know for three phase, they're very particular about the cabling because we had lots of problems with it lately. So you have to know what you're doing, and it takes kind of a lot of time setting up, doing site surveys and so on. It's a fairly mm. time-consuming yeah. process. Mm. I think we need to look at whether there's any source of funding for, for projects such as yours, Dave, where three phase might actually be pre preferable from the view of the town because yeah. um so, so i might put this to the parish council because we've been trying to think of where we could put some ev parking you know uh, charge points and it's really quite difficult because we didn't want to yeah. get to the point where we put them in the car park say and then that was meant we lost a car parking space, which is another issue in the town, of course. Well, yes, we kind of have the same thing with, with our members too, so which is yeah. why we kind of partitioned off this new secure car park to get around that. But yeah. I mean, luckily, the three phases are only kind of five to ten metres away, so I think yeah. costs may be not prohibitive, but for certain projects where it has to go, you know, 50, 100 metres, then it's maybe a different story. Yeah. So, Anthony, what's another question. happening with induction loops? Mm. Sorry? What's happening with induction loops and induction charging? Anthony, is that going at all well? 
Well, it's still in its very infancy and uh you know i don't think there's a standard yet i mean it it, it works and there are some pilots including in milton Keynes. i think they run a, a fleet of buses that that stop at a depot on a, a wireless pad um but i think it's a bit too soon um at the moment and obviously it need to be standardized to to ensure that you know you didn't have a whole load of different bespoke wireless charging pads you'd want it to be used more broadly uh, I, I i i haven't checked what the efficiency of that is and whether there are significant losses or my not that need to be... my, my toothbrush works really well and has done for 20 years on an induction system yeah yeah so it, it, who knows and 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 there's there's you know there's also pilots actually looking at obviously putting induction pads on the road itself by men um men. on the yeah. road yeah. yeah, but again, it would be weighing that up against the infrastructure cost. I mean, uh, my feeling is that that may have been more viable if the charging speeds weren't getting so quick. But if it gets to a point where you can go to a service station and you can charge in five minutes at 300 kilowatts or something like that, then I think that seems more likely than than relaying all the roads in the country or at least all the motorways with, with, with wireless pads. But I might be wrong. We'll see. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question from the chat list is from Paul. I've been looking for a vehicle to grid connector and use to use our e-cars to power our home, but can't find a mature technology. Are they new around? Are they now around? Sorry, I misread that. <laughs> I think um, this has one answer from Anthony Leonard also on the, the chat saying to look at octopusy power loop yeah, so just so, to, just to clarify that so it, oh, yeah. so uh, it's not for uh, a nissan which uh, it's it's for the bmw or a golf yeah at, at, the, at, at the moment those vehicles are not capable of two-way charging um own, it needs a particular connector it's a bit, um for those who are old enough for vhs and beta but most connectors, rapid charging connectors in the UK, in, in Europe, are what's called CCS. But there are, um, but then, but some of the Asian models like Nissan, they use a, a protocol called CHAdeMO, which is different. And CHAdeMO does enable two-way charging, but CCS doesn't. Now it's like it's likely that around about 2025 or by around about 2025. We think that that two-way charging will be feasible for most electric cars it's that's the sort of roadmap that people are talking about um but it's going to be very very niche until then um and in terms of you know so, so you do need you, pretty much you need a nissan you need a nissan leaf or a nissan van um and then there are pilot projects so somebody mentioned octopus power loop which is uh, looking for 100 people but again that's I don't I don't think it's in your region that's in the UK power networks region which is sort of London and the east of the country we're running a a, a, a V2G project but it's in the western power distributions area which I don't think includes Watlington it does include Milton Keynes which is not so far away and um, Vista but I think you guys may be in Scottish and Southern Electrics area in which case there was the only that the only there was one by a company called Ovo Energy, uh, which was national, I understand, but that I think is coming to an end. So, um, uh, yeah. Anyway, it's improving. The charges are getting much smaller and much cheaper, but they're still quite expensive. And and we're going to see a real tr transition to two-way charging possibilities once it's a general standard. Thanks. So, um, another question here from Keith. Electric buses have been mentioned. How realistic is it to expect electrification of other large vehicles, e.g. Good, goods vehicles? Yeah, well, we, um, I don't know if anyone has seen the Tesla Semi, it's called, which is a huge vehicle that's coming that um, it will probably have a megawatt charger or something like that. But it will, again, compared to the efficiency of similar vehicles, it will have a much reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I understand the fuel costs will pay itself back in a very, very short period of time. They are more expensive, but the fuel savings uh, or the fuel bills on, on huge 
vehicles are massive. Um, so um, yeah, so we, we started off with really small vans like the Nissan van and, and the Renault Kangoo. We're now seeing medium sized vans coming to market. I think like there's Peugeot and, and um, there's a Mercedes van and more like the sort of Ford Transit kind of size. And they will steadily get bigger as the costs continue to come down and the energy density continues to improve. Um, we will be seeing larger and larger vehicles. Great. Um, Dave Parks, this is a great question that I wanted to ask as well. How feasible would it be for the uh, social club uh, to be used by a car sharing club, e-car club? So you're talking about one person having overnight charging and then the, another one having day charging? Well, e-car clubs are generally um, run by a company that have several cars and people sign up to be able to, to use the cars. The car sharing is, yeah. Yeah. Presumably there's no reason why you couldn't have one slot in the car park, which was taken by an e by a car club, uh, which people would, would use like any other car club, like you have in, in Oxford, there are spaces where there are little cars and you go along with your credit card and you stick it on the window and it opens the doors and off you go and you book it online. So in theory, you could do that with it with an e-car and it would just happen to live in the Watlington Club. It depends what yeah. you So I can't see any reasons why not. I mean, you need a remote control to get in, in and out of the car park. So there's maybe some practical things to resolve to do something like that. But yeah, I think it's certainly something that we could look at. Good. Great. Um, just checking to see if there's any more questions. Oh, what's this one? Um, lost it. Okay, so I can't see any more questions. So I think our numbers have dwindled somewhat now. So, so perhaps this is a good time to make a close. Uh, thank all our speakers. They're really great. Yeah, thank you very much. Really interesting. Much appreciated. And this will be put on a blog and on, on, on the website and it's been yeah. recorded so we'll be able to access the, the whole recording. Yeah, and any questions we've missed, we'll uh, post responses on there. Um, and Anthony, um, you mentioned that you had links to your videos, so we'll, we'll share those out as well. Thank you really? very much. Thank, thank you very much, much, everyone. Really good. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. Brilliant. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>